Hello and welcome to another episode of Hometown Daily News. I am Mayor Watt. That's my site. It aggregates news into six categories and then into channels within those categories. The categories are create news, education, entertainment, social, and technology. And today I'm going over about 20 articles. Takes about an hour. Some of it might be interesting to you. Other articles might not be. You can let me know in chat if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, eventually it'll get posted over to YouTube and as an Apple podcast. Uh, I haven't been putting it anywhere else yet, but I'm considering it. You can always go over to hometown.com and get all of this news. It's really just a snippet that's on the site. And then I link to the other site, the originator of the news. Um, I aggregate about 200 news sources into one site so that I can consume it. Um, I have a very broad <laughs> array of interests and uh, I don't, I, I can't go from site to site, um, but I can hopefully pique your curiosity about a bunch of topics and you'll go over to the site and check it all out. Um, with all that in mind, let's get into the show. Um, the very first article is over in the mobile channel. And the, the title of it is uh, retail sales rose in February, but inflation is starting to take its toll on spending. Sales rose apparently 0.3% from January, a sharp slowdown in growth. Now that's what happens when you have threats of uh, interest rates increasing and inflation increasing and uh, salaries, depending on the sector you're in, attorneys are making just, well, really good attorneys are making a ton of money more, um, even as first years, but Anyway, let's go over to the article's source. Um, this article is over in New York Times. It's written by uh, Coral Murphy Marcos. And it has this little data point where um, it kind of highlights a recession um, back in 2020, uh, largely brought on by a complete economic collapse due to COVID. But let's look past that. Um, it says the slower growth, January's retail sales increased 4.9%. Revised data showed following other indicators or indications that consumers were growing more pessimistic as they faced persistent rising prices with no end in sight. Yeah, and um, you witness that when you're going over to the store here in the, in the States. Um, you know, inflation, uh, cost of living, interest rates... It, it, it's just outpacing salaries. Uh, meanwhile, uh, corporations are having record profits. So it's really, you know, the smaller people, the, the smaller shops are, are bearing the burden of this um, change in economic policy and this sociological um, change not really change. I mean, it's been brewing this way for a, a long time. Um, people that have the means to survive this are still taking more, and the people who can't weather the storm um, are going to be left out in the cold. So, you know, you, I guess you can't take home $400 million as a salary or something uh, in complete in your complete golden parachute or economic package for a year. Um, and still have somebody uh, getting a, a cost of living increase. And, and I'm kind of ranting right now, but the reality of it is uh, there are so many people out here who haven't gotten a pay raise yet. Everything is increasing in costs and there isn't necessarily an opportunity to seek better employment. And I don't think that's really what we should be perpetuating as a society if you're an asset to a company, that, then you should be compensated for it. You shouldn't have to feel like you have to abandon everything that you have done for a company just to seek a better salary, 
um, and literally you start over in a new place. Um, but that is what we have basically ingrained in our society that it's nothing more than a gig economy. You can be abandoned and you can abandon others, uh, simply by walking out the door. Um, and there's, you know, largely zero loyalty, um, between employee and employer. And I don't think that's really the right mindset as a society. Uh, but then again, that's my take, right? So, um, costs are increasing. There's conflict around the world. Um, namely Ukraine and Russia. I try to not involve that in every episode, but it really is uh, dominating the news. Uh, even when you're talking about something about retail sales, it invades that as well. So um, if you want to know more about this particular article, um, you can go over to New York Times or click the link that's in chat, uh, or of course the podcast description and YouTube. The next article is over in uh, the mobile channel, and I'm going to go through these um, at a steady click so that we can get done in an hour so that uh, I'm not uh, kind of just on a soapbox periodically. But I want to pique your curiosity, like I said at the beginning of this. U.S. fires have become four times larger and three times more frequent since 2000. Uh, fires have gotten larger, more frequent, and more widespread across the United States since 2000, according to a new University of Colorado Boulder led paper. Recent wildfires have stoked concern that climate change is causing more extreme events, and the work published in today, uh, published today in Science Advances, shows that uh, large fires have not only become more common; they're also spreading into new areas, impacting land that previously did not burn. So this article is over at phys.org. It's um, written by Ceres, C-I-R-E-S. Um, it has a neat picture of a, a plane that is uh, dropping fire retardant on a forest fire uh, on a hill. Those are really neat to see. Uh, it's a DC-10, according to the picture. Those are really neat to see uh, do their thing. Um, when I was in California, Southern California, you would see them uh, periodically in the, the dropping retardant out there to stop the fires. Um, it says here, projected changes in climate, fuel, and ignitions suggest that we'll see more and larger fires in the future. Our analyses uh, show that those changes are already happening, said Virginia Iglesias, a research scientist with CU Boulder Earth, Earth, Earth Lab and lead author of the paper. Um, you should do a search about the global warming um, data and you will invariably find an animated uh, gif of the uh, basically it's a, a ring of data starting back I, I think it's something like the 1800s or something like that and it kind of spirals around a center point um, reflecting what the average or mean uh, temperature is uh, for the year or the season and as the season, as the data point pivots around the central point, it ever increases out further and further and further. And we're beyond the one degree mark, um, trending towards that one and a half degree mark, and it'll be catastrophic. Um, at least all of the theories suggest that it'll be catastrophic. But we see things that are happening, and... Um, we as a society, I do reference it quite a bit in my streams, um, need to change our ways to remedy these concerns. Otherwise, we will not have a healthy earth to take care of. Um, that said, let's get into the next article. Uh, the next article is over in Warcrafter's channel, Minecraft 1.19, everything we know about the wild update. And yes, the links are an eclectic mess of uh, various points of interest that I have, and um, that includes Minecraft. Um, it says, want to learn more about Minecraft 1.19 update? Uh, Moyang has uh, announced the next major version update coming to Minecraft, and it's packed with even more new biomes, blocks, and mobs. Um, Minecraft will launch in 2022, but Moyang hasn't given a specific date yet. 
the second half of the Caves and Cliffs update launched in November of 2021. So it seems likely that the Wild update won't arrive until 2022. And let me click this link here. Um, this article is over at PC Gamer, written by Lauren Morton. And um, it has a cool picture. Um, I guess it's from Mojang. And yeah, that's how it's pronounced, apparently. Um, a lot of people pronounce it Mojang, but it's not Mojang, it's Mojang. I don't necessarily think they care how you pronounce it, you know, and they're going to be offended. But um, from what I have been uh, told, it is Mojang. Uh, with that in mind, I encourage you to go over to um, PCGamer.com and Again, you can click the link. It'll take you to Ohm Town. You can read a little bit about this update um, there, but it's from PCGamer.com, and you should click the link to the source and go over there. I don't go through the entire article, um, but there there will be snapshots for Java, um, which I treat as beta versions. It says Ma Minecraft 1.19 beta versions. You can also try out some of the wild update features in Minecraft for Windows by toggling on wild update. Um, oh yeah, and that's right, that Minecraft is owned by Microsoft. So who knows, based on reports that are uh, being said, um, you're gonna see ads for <laughs> Minecraft in your file system. Um, as you're browsing through your file system, you'll see ads according to a, a report about Windows 11. Um, and you'll need a cloud account to even create, to, to log into the computer you purchase according to reports, but we shall see. We'll see if that actually is um, made manifest. Um, I won't be too happy about it. I want a local login and I don't really care for a cloud login to my systems. Um, but let's go on to the next article. Um, this next article is in the Warcrafters um, channel. That's a channel about um, first person shooters, real time sims, and role playing games. Um, typically, kind of the, um, the looter shooter kind of um, games. And this here says Electronic Arts has announced that because of Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, esports players and teams based in Russia and Belarus are no longer allowed to compete in Apex Legends and FIFA 22 Pro Leagues. And that's the title of this article. Russian esports teams banned from Apex Legends, FIFA, and uh, Rainbow Six Siege Pro Leagues. Um, it's... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about this because, you know, these are just people that are playing games and, and building hype around the game in that sector and they're having a good time and they're competing for themselves. Um, I guess, you know, stamping out any, um, any representation of Russia is, is part of the, the process of sanctioning and, and being displeased with what the leadership is doing. Um, and, uh, it's a real shame that that leadership is impacting so many people in Russia who have nothing to do with this. And, um, and it's too bad that they're even doing any action in Ukraine. So I can't really say much about it other than that. Um, it says, uh, this is written by Andy Chalk over at PC Gamer, just to make sure that I've made mention of who wrote all of this um, under here. I'm not going to read the entire thing. I don't do that anyway, um, at least not on stream. I do read it after. Um, but yeah, it says EA's decision to ban Russia and Belarus from its pro leagues comes two weeks after ESL. Suspended Russian teams Virtus.pro and Gambit from ESL Pro League Season 15. Um, and smaller pro league operators Blast and Elisa have also imposed bans on Russian-based organizations. It's, it's a shame. And, and I can imagine now that it's going to be this kind of tit-for-tat uh, back and forth between 
um, one organization in one country and another whenever anybody is displeased with the actions of the people that run the government at the time. Um, and while I understand the machinations there, I don't necessarily uh, think that it is productive for the person. Um, you know, trying to hobble the government and its messaging and all of that kind of stuff, I understand, but innocent bystanders are being impacted by what a few in government are dictating, and of course the followers that believe it, um, whatever the government is saying. It's somewhat ridiculous. And, um, you know, Russia shouldn't be in Ukraine. It's an autonomous country. It has been for a long time, a lot longer than what memories of the humans are. And the history of Ukraine is going to be rewritten if this is allowed to continue. And that's a shame. Uh, the next article, sorry to get on that soapbox. I, I try not to, but it's the nature of this type of stream. When you're talking about news, um, sometimes it all crosses over. This next article is in the Stock Marketeers channel, uh, Market Extra. What happens to money when the Fed starts shrinking its balance sheet? The Federal Reserve plans to reduce its record-sized balance sheet from nearly $9 trillion to help cool inflation at 40 years high, potentially starting in May. Here's what happens to the money. So if you're ever curious about what actually happens, uh, this article um, was initially published on March 16th at 8.18 a.m., but it was updated today as well at 3.35 p.m., um, and it's written by Joy Wiltermuth. Uh, the big risk here, this is a quote uh, from Bank of America's Cabana. The big risk here is that there is too much debt outstanding for the market to easily take down. Uh, and this is, um, there's a picture of the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell uh, is expected to raise interest rates for the first time since 2018 on Wednesday and potentially provide a roadmap for cutting its record balance sheet. Um, stock market went up uh, according to these tickers here. And uh, I'm sure not all of it. I haven't actually looked at today's numbers, um, but it says as the federal reserve gears up to shrink its $9 trillion balance dollar balance sheet uh, to help cool inflation running at 40 year highs, tricky questions can emerge about what happens next to the money in the system. So where does money come from to help stabilize markets during the pandemic? Back in 2020, the Fed started buying treasury and agency mortgage-backed securities at a $120 billion monthly pace through B of A Securities, Citigroup Global Markets, JP Morgan Securities, and other primary dealers, uh, or the 24 large banks and brokers now authorized to deal directly with the central bank. Um, and this is the type of interaction between the big banks and uh, the Federal Reserve, which is a quasi-government agency. Um, the, so back in 2008, there was an economic collapse and the same type of uh, process um, took place where money was disgorged from the Federal Reserve out to all of these banks. Um, and regular Joes didn't see anything short of, well, a lot of things didn't collapse, arguably, right? Um, whereas regular Joes don't get that benefit. Um, we You don't typically get bailed out. If you have medical or um, student debt or other things, and it, you can file for bankruptcy. It'll haunt you for seven years, depending on your age. You'll never get out from under it. Um, or I should say it's really rough. But um, banks really didn't end up anything back in 2008. And then it happens again and it happens again. Now it's just happening more frequently uh, based on my uh, perception of things. 
um, but they they go into greater detail over here on Market Watch. Um, this article is over at Market Watch, written by Joy Wiltermuth, and it's what happens to money when the Fed starts shrinking its balance sheet. And it's a much more involved scenario, so I encourage you to go over to the site and uh, take a look at it. This next article is in the Mobile Channel, and <clears throat> pardon me. Um, it says business updates, Starbucks CEO retires and Howard Schultz steps in as interim head. Uh, the international, uh, energy agency said, Oh, wait, hold on a second. Let me click this link. Cause I want to see about, this is a bunch of stuff that was, um, published by the New York times, um, kind of updated as the day goes by. And so it has, Things like uh, the Starbucks CEO retires and Howard Schultz steps in as interim chief executive, which is perfect timing because Starbucks had been pulling out of um, Russia and the the <laughs> the implications of doing that um, is pretty big um, because uh, Putin has threatened to nationalize all of those products. And that's why I actually clicked this is because um, somebody else this CEO retiring at the peak of probably uh, a tumultuous time um, in Starbucks uh, history is really interesting. It's literally like handing somebody a flaming hot cup of Joe and uh, spilling it on them here, take this. Um, and uh, yesterday I heard that Papa John's will continue to do its operations in Russia um, which if that news goes viral, uh, it's going to be probably the worst possible thing for Papa John's, um, domestically because people will just stop going to Papa John's. <laughs> it's for all intents, it's on the wrong side of history. Um, literally saying, well, you know, yeah, we know that everybody else, well, a lot of name brands are, you know, beaten feet out of Russia and the, the guy that runs all of the Papa John's in Russia is saying, no, I'll stick around something like 500 stores. Um, here it says stocks rally after feds rate increase for a second day of big gains. Again, I didn't look at the stock market the last couple of days. Um, I guess I should, um, you know, if you're interested in the stock market, and I am interested in business, the stock market, strategic management, things like that. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where the stock market is really about, uh, for the most part, institutional trading is, is giving the ebb and flow of a uh, stock market profiteering. Um, and some of us can, you know, make a little bit of a, a profit. Um, yeah, not and I'm not really going into the many people that are on wall street bets that, um, are taking part in making some money. Um, it's in the grand scheme of things, it's few and far between that regular Joe's are making bank on the stock market. Um, but you can dream, right? Uh, Russian sanctions could create supply crisis as oil output falls. It's artificially, falling. Uh, uh, we have OPEC nations that can provide every drop of oil that every country needs. And, uh, the only difference between then and now is that it's an opportunity to extract greater profits. And I say it like that because it's downright predatory. Um, and you can't tell me about supply and demand. There's, there's enough to go around. Um, unless, there is this uh, massive conspiracy uh, floating around that suggests that we're about to lose all of our oil uh, around the world. There is enough oil around the world to still be stable when someone like Russia um, is cut off. But let's keep on going. There's more in this article um, about Starbucks CEO retiring, um, but um, it's, it's basically about the, the pandemic, uh, 
uh, it's gonna here let me scroll down a little bit more um, yeah yeah I mean <laughs> it, it's really just I see it on Wednesday in an abrupt move Starbucks said mr. Johnson who has held the job since 2017 will retire uh, April 4th after 13 years with the company yeah so hey here's that boiling hot cup of coffee I'm outie but that's good I mean if you don't want to do the job anymore don't do the job um, I thought that this one was interesting this next article um, is uh, Jameson Irish whiskey is releasing its first canned cocktail for the US Jameson Irish whiskey is making its RTD uh, debut with the release of new 6% ABV canned ginger and lime cocktail, according to a press release. Uh, and in quotes, it says the Jameson ginger and lime ready to drink cocktail is inspired by one of our all time favorite fan favorite recipes said Kate Pomeroy head of innovation at Pernod. I think it's Pernod. I, it's such a, I think it's a soft D Pernod, um, Ricard, North America. Our goal was simple to create a cocktail experience that is easy and delicious. So, and that's an observation that I have made. They, they write in this article, whiskey based canned cocktails have seen a surge in popularity recently echoing consumer demand for ready to drink concoctions. Jameson hopes to take advantage of that popularity with its own iteration. And yeah, I've been watching that happen um, over the last couple of years, few years, actually, mm, probably a little bit longer than a few years, probably five. Um, at least I've been watching it ramp up. Now, this article is over at vinepair.com. It's uh, written by Lee Goldstein, L-I, um, and then the last name is Goldstein. And uh, they always have some uh, kind of article flavored artwork, which matches the uh, the gist of the article. And so it has a lime and a green background, uh, and a can of Jameson ginger and lime. Uh, yeah, I, I keep thinking that I'll go and try this stuff, but, um, uh, right now I can't, so I'm actually teetotaling it, uh, at least for the next 90 days. We'll see uh, how long that lasts. I might just crack under the pressure and I need a beer. Um, so yeah, definitely go over to vinepair.com and check it out. I'm going to continue on with the next article. Uh, the next article is in um, the Mobile Channel, and it says Senate approves making daylight savings time or daylight saving time permanent, uh, which is really interesting because for the last few days I've been kind of grousing about the fact that I lost an hour, and so it says legislation that passed unanimously would end the practice of setting clocks back one hour in the fall. Its prospects were uncertain in the house. Um, you know, there, there was a time when it was important. Um, and nowadays I just don't think that it's important. Uh, this article is in the New York times.com site uh, written by Luke Broadwater and Amelia Narenberg. Um, it says after losing an hour of sleep over the weekend, members of the United States Senate returned to the Capitol, uh, this week, a bit groggy and in a mood to put an end to all of this frustrating clock changing. Um, I had read somebody, uh, stating that there was a time in the nineties that there was a service that would go from house to house and, uh, you would pay them either $25 or $50 and they would reset all of your clocks every time, uh, there was a power outage or, um, a, uh, a time change like this, right? Uh, so twice a year. And then whenever the power goes out, if you don't know how to uh, set the clock on your VCR, um, they would come and fix it. They probably made a lot of money. And of course, somebody has to step up to the plate to speak in favor of the bill. And in this case, Senator Marco Rubio, a Republican of Florida, rose to the uh, Senate floor to uh, on Tuesday to speak in favor of the bill called the Sunshine Protection Act. Um, these are all 
these names, I'm, I guess I'm cynical, um, in the sense that, you know, the freedom act was one of the, one of those oppressive kind of acts, um, where, or Patriot Act is another one. You know, there's always something cynical about it. Um, this is the Sunshine Protection Act. Even though it's not impacting anything, uh, the sun will shine the same number of hours. The um, the and and night will come and go, and it really doesn't do anything except its objective was to basically uh, give. Uh, people a uh, time to leave the house when it was daylight instead of night um, or really dark, I should say more like dusk or dawn. Um, so this bill will just put an end to the whole flip the, the switch every um, twice a year. Oh, and so, and the, the reality of it is uh, now is a time when it doesn't even matter about flipping the clock. Um, we have computers that automatically switch. We've got an, you know, watches that automatically switch. <laughs> it literally doesn't matter anymore. Uh, let's continue on to the next article. Um, this is in the continuity report channel, which I really want to launch, but I want to co-host with me. I want to talk uh, with people about TV shows and uh, movies. So again, if you are listening to this and you're interested, get in touch with me. Um, maybe we can figure something out. So this article is titled Netflix will prompt subscribers to pay for users outside their households in new test to address unauthorized password sharing. Um, Netflix will soon launch a test letting primary account holders pay an additional fee for users outside their households. A new attempt by the company to address illicit password sharing. Um, click this link, you get taken over to, pardon me, Variety. And it says, um, oh, well, it's written by Todd Spangler. And so it says, uh, according to the Netflix terms of service, a customer's account, quote, may not be shared with individuals beyond your household. Um, so I wonder what the scope of household is defined as. Hmm. Uh, after years of turning a blind eye to password sharing uh, behavior that falls outside of that requirement, the company last year ran a limited test prompting users to enter their account credentials as a way to nudge freeloaders into paying for their own accounts, which, you know, I mean, if people sharing the password and you've got 15 different logins from different 15 different IPs on different sides of the states, um, or in demonstrably different locations, you're not in the same household in, in the truest sense of the word. This is a household, um, not the diaspora. Yeah, they are going to start cutting back. It says now in an upcoming test launching in three countries, uh, Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru. Netflix will let members who share their accounts with people outside their household do so easily and securely while also paying a bit more. Well, I wonder how they're going to get uh, what the amount is. I don't, it, it says what it is, but is it really going to happen? I guess they could geolock around a location and just say, if you're outside you know, two miles of this location, you're not I'm going to be able to log in with somebody else's account. You know, geolocation, it's a thing. So in the test countries, the cost for adding a sub member is, uh, I don't even know, what is CLP? Um, I know that it's Chile, but is it, what, how is it pronounced? I'm not sure. Um, but it basically amounts to an extra member costing about three bucks, three U.S. dollars. Yeah, I think that would be the equivalent uh, across the board. Um, but like Twitch, it might be um, geolocated um, for the price as well. So if the cost of living is lower or higher wherever you might be, the price will be lower or higher wherever you might be. We'll see if there is a, a change in any of their reporting 
as the year goes on. Uh, the next article is in the Word in Tech channel. Amazon workers in New York, oop, pardon me, in New York and Maryland are protesting for better wages. Around 60 workers banded together to demand a $3 raise, which is, <laughs> um, I suppose, you know, nothing. Um, it's not going to offset inflation, that's for sure. Um, I wish them luck. Uh, early Wednesday morning, Amazon workers staged a walkout in two states, quitting work and even shutting off a machine uh, to demand a $3 raise. The workers also demanded that Amazon bring back 20-minute breaks, a perk introduced during COVID that the company has since replaced with 15-minute breaks, according to Vice. The actions are part of a wave of labor activism at Amazon as more employees band together to demand better working conditions, compensation, and representation. Um, it said, it also says in this article that it's 60 workers. It's written by, uh, Mitchell Clark, uh, for the verge. And, um, it's, it's interesting in that Amazon just raised the price of, um, of prime. So where's the extra money going? You know, I mean, we need to share this wealth with the people that are making it possible. And I completely understand that there is somebody that started this business. There are people that are running the business, but without the workers, you don't have the business until you automate and good luck. And you're automating quite a bit already. Um, but those fine motor skills are a real pain in the butt to re to reproduce with robots. Um, but there's a lot of money out there that maybe somebody will do that and, uh, and make a mint on the patent. Um, but I talk to people <laughs> regularly about automation and, uh, where the future is going to be taking jobs, um, and to be prepared. So, uh, as people fight the good fight, the people with the money will replace workers with automation. It's just the nature of the beast. That is exactly what's going to happen. Um, and uh, like I say in uh, previously in this stream and previously in other episodes, we need a societal change where people start respecting each other. Uh, right now, these Amazon employees are seen as chattel and can be fired and hired um, regularly and, and without any concern, uh, for the human condition. And a lot of people will sit there and say, well, you're being naive or whatever else, uh, they can come up with. Um, but when they become the victim of this, they either, uh, stop talking or they lean into it and say, well, I'll win the game. Yeah, good luck until somebody wants to fire you again. Um, but go over to The Verge and read this article. Amazon workers in New York and Maryland are protesting for better wages. And it says Amazonians, Amazonians, uh, Amazonians, uh, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, Amazonians United coordinated a walkout uh, early Wednesday morning. Good luck. I do sincerely wish you good luck. The next article um, is the original Winamp skin is selling as an NFT. So this is in the word and tech. Um, again, um, just a reminder, I don't uh, read the full article prior to the show. So I'm not sure if the company itself um, that or the person that owns the copyright for Winamp is the one that is selling it as an NFT, but let's read this article together. Uh, Winamp will sell a non-fungible token linked to its, yeah, linked to its media player's original 1997 graphical skin, becoming the latest company to blend nostalgia and crypto. It's not really crypto. I mean, it's an NFT. It just happens to be powered by crypto. Uh, Winamp will put the NFT up for auction through OpenSea, which is basically the standard place, 
uh, between May 16th and May 22nd, followed by a separate sale of 1997 total NFTs based on 20 artworks derived from the original skin. And the proceeds will go to the Winamp Foundation, which promises to donate them to charity projects, um, starting with the Belgian Nonprofit Music Fund. I wonder... Okay, so the NFT sale appears to be a combination of a publicity move and a fundraising effort. So let's click this link and take you to the source. This is an article over at TheVerge.com uh, by Addie Robertson. And if you've never used Winamp, it still works to this day. I actually recently downloaded it again. Um, I have a licensed um, version of the, the Winamp um, application and, uh, I loved Winamp. I was around when it first dropped. Um, and it just, it was awesome. And that's pretty much all I can say about this. Um, again, it's an article over at the verge. Uh, the original Winamp skin is selling as an NFT and that the uh, proceeds from the open sea auction will go to charity. Uh, the article is written by Addie Robertson. And if you're curious about this, just do a search for uh, Winamp NFT, and I'm sure it'll take you there. It's going to be so it's going to be popular enough that it will rise uh, in the search results um, because search results are primarily popularity driven. Um, it says Winamp isn't precisely the service you might remember from the 90s. The MP3 playing software was acquired by AOL in 1999, then sold to an online radio company, Radionomy, in 2014, and after a long decline and shutdown. Radionomy, and later its majority stakeholder, Audio Valley, revamped it as a mobile audio app, then announced a broader relaunch for this year. There's also a long-running community update project for the original app. Um, so it's still alive. Yeah, they even talk about LimeWire and stuff. Uh, man, talk about nostalgia. Uh, I have, I've loved Winamp from the very beginning of its launch. So, um, And they're doing it for a good cause, apparently. So uh, good luck. This next article is over in the Order of the Bean. Um, yes, the the channel is actually just called of the bean um, because you can be whatever you are of the bean but the the identity of the channel is order of the bean um, because we are all member if we're into coffee then we are a member of the order of the bean um, this surprised me i had no idea that this was taking place um, but um Revel to acquire Italian espresso maker Lalit for $124 million, which seems really inexpensive. Um, but maybe I have a misperception of the provenance of Lalit. It's uh, Australia's Breville Group has announced plans to acquire the Italian prosumer espresso equipment company Lalit in a deal worth 113 million euro or 124 million US dollars. Um, in cash and shares. So let's click this link. It'll take us over to Daily Coffee News. Uh, this is actually an older article, um, but my aggregator just grabbed it for some reason. And um, it kind of goes into some greater detail. It says the acquisition is expected to be finalized by early July. Ooh, pardon me. And... Um, Let's see what else. Yeah, I'm not sure what all really is um, much more exciting in this. Breville acquired United States Barraza in a $60 million deal in 2020. So Breville's kind of scooping up stuff. And um, I've been considering a new espresso machine. And I've always liked the look of the elite ones. So um, maybe it'll come down in price, but uh, the ones that kind of 
pique my curiosity are way too expensive for me to justify <laughs> um, for making espressos. So we'll see. Hopefully the quality stays high uh, because I do dig the look. Okay, so this next article um, is the Wemo smart plug with uh, thread review, an affordable and fast home kit outlet. Wemo's latest home kit smart plug carries a small price tag, but boasts thread connectivity for rapid response times and excellent home coverage. I'm going to click this link. Um, you know, it, it says the new Wemo smart plug with thread at CES 2022 Belkin made a few home kit announcements. Hmm. It revealed its Wemo smart video doorbell. And this interesting. So the article is written um, by Andrew O'Hara over at Apple insider. And I have yet to buy a smart outlet. Um, but anything with HomeKit, I think, is just awesome uh, when it works. And, and when HomeKit doesn't work, uh, it's almost impossible to find a source of the problem. So you basically just reboot it. Um, that that, that uh, tech support phrase, have you turned it off and on again, pretty much solves most problems until you get into more complicated systems. Um, but this, basically, you just turn it off, turn it back on, and it reconnects. Um, but this here, it says uh, Belkin has released the first of several hardware refreshes that come with thread from the onset, um, the Wemo smart plug. So what would you use a smart plug for? You think it would be cool to turn something off remotely? Um, the lights that you actually see behind me um, are controllable as well, but they're not Wemo. Um, those are, uh, twinkly, I think they're called. Yeah. And, um, I can program those to do all kinds of patterns and stuff like that. And when I actually stand in my desk, everything is framed properly. Um, but I've been sitting for my shows here. Um, let's see. One side has the home kit pairing sticker that can be added to the Apple uh, smart home platform via NFC, which is a nice solution. Just bring your phone near the, uh, during setup and the security code will be transmitted wirelessly. Um, hopefully not. <laughs> well, I guess it, as long as it doesn't repeatedly do it and you have to put it in kind of a, uh, restart mode at some point, um, you know, security wise, you don't want somebody else being able to, uh, mess around with your Wi-Fi outlet. Um, let's see here. Upgraded with thread. The big news here is that the Wemo smart plug joins the growing list of thread enabled products. Thread is, is an emerging connectivity standard to rival Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and others. So at some point, if it is like, I don't know, um, there, whenever there's a competition, the, the winner is basically the one that's more bang for the buck. Um, and hopefully it retains the security capabilities, um, or has superior capabilities. And I, I would switch to thread if, um, it all has, um, all of the elements that make it a superior product. Uh, I would dump pretty much everything. Um, let's continue on. Uh-oh. Let me see if something broke. There we go. So all the home kit locks that support Apple home key. Now this is an article in smack talk. Um, as part of iOS 15, Apple introduced a new smart home feature dubbed home key that unlocks your door using NFC, which is absolutely awesome. And uh, if I can use my watch instead of anything else, then that would be great too. And they have a list of locks that support Apple home key. And uh, I will end up upgrading to this. 
uh, because I need a new one. Uh, I need a new one anyway, so um, I might as well do this because why not? I just dig tech. So this is the Schlage Encode Plus Smart Wi-Fi Deadbolt. It connects over Wi-Fi and will come in an array of different finishes and it'll be available for $299. Wow, that is a lot though. Oof, my goodness. Acura A100 and they have more, I'm sure. This one's 365, but it is a deadbolt and the door handle itself, um, which uh, if it comes in different finishes, awesome. Oh, wow. It says this tall and slim door lock works over Zigbee or Bluetooth. If the batteries die, it can be powered up using a USB-C cable or unlocked using a physical key. Yeah, I could do without the physical key. Um, but if it works, it works. I'll have to look into both of these. Um, and you should go over to this article over at Apple Insider. It's written by Andrew O'Hara and it's titled All the HomeKit Locks That Support Apple Home Key. Um, the next article, oh, let me refresh this. A uh, new leaked iPhone 14 Pro renders, uh, they back up the whole punch rumors. If you haven't heard about this, um, there's a lot of people that are talking about this whole punch problem. Um, a new series of purported iPhone 14 Pro 3D CAD renders back up the previous leak details, including claims of a hole punch design instead of a notch. Um, and not the coder for Minecraft notch. It's notch. It's a, a hole. Anyway, so that's apparently what it looks like. This is an article over at appleinsider.com written by William Gallagher. And um, I can't remember what they call it, but there's, uh, I think it's called a keyhole and a punch, um, not a whole punch um, all together. There's this little slot and then there's the hole punch, um, which to me, uh, there's different people that get bent out of shape about this regardless. It being a render, it could be somebody's imagination. Um, but it says uh, leaks about forthcoming iPhone 14 Pro started even before the iPhone 13 Pro was launched. Uh, now a new set of what are said to be 3D CAD renders claim to show the whole design of the next iPhone. And according to 91 Mobiles, the iPhone 14 will sport a new design, but only from the front. I highly doubt it. If Apple is notorious for one thing, they will move that camera over three millimeters and you'll need a new case. Um, because somebody did an ergonomic study and found that um, it was uh, more important to the industrial design and solutions uh, that it be moved over three millimeters, making every case obsolete. Um, so we'll see. Right. I say that a lot. We'll see. A lot of predictions uh, are accurate, uh, but maybe this one isn't precise. Despite previous rumors that iPhone 14 will go eSIM only, the renders show a regular SIM tray. Yeah, as soon as they get rid of SIMs, that'd be, that's fine with me. I don't flip SIMs around, but in some places you need to. Um, Okay, so this next article is in the Daily News show. That's this. Saharan dust storm covers Spain, reaches France, and Portugal. Um, this is something that I thought was interesting because it's a huge dust storm swirling over Europe from the Sahara Desert, and it's made it hard to breathe in large parts of uh, Spain for a second day straight. So this article is over at ABC News. A uh, Saharan dust storm covers Spain, spreads out across Europe. Let me pause this. And uh, it's written by Joseph Wilson for the Associated Press. And yeah, in Spain, it, the, the sky basically looks uh, orange because the sun is filtering through all the dust. Um, and there's quite a bit 
of information about this. It says authorities recommended for people to wear a face mask still in wide use because of the pandemic anyway, and avoid out outdoor exercise, especially for those suffering from respiratory diseases. Um, emergency services for Madrid told the AP that so far there had been no increase in calls for care to people who uh, have breathing problems and could be because everybody's wearing a mask, which is awesome. Uh, not just for this reason, but because of COVID. Um, Let's hope that it all clears out and uh, doesn't cause too much uh, regional issues. Uh, but it's a br pretty big swath of a uh, region that's being impacted by all of this dust. And this is the kind of stuff that climate change is going to continue to lead to. Unless we change our ways. Um, this next article is over on Warcrafters. Uh, Elden Ring has sold 12 million copies in just three weeks. And it says here, Elden Ring is absolutely dominating gaming right now. Uh, the Twitter timeline is flooded with it. PC Gamer Office ends up talking about bosses and strategies uh, at least once a day. And uh, I need to shorten what the aggregator is grabbing from this. It really shouldn't be the quite as much, but... Anyway, this article is written by Molly Taylor uh, over at PCGamer.com. It says, it took the Dark Souls series three games to reach the same milestone. Wow, that's amazing. But it had a ton of hype, um, and people are playing it uh, endlessly, ceaselessly on Twitch. And uh, I've watched so many people play this game that... Um, uh, there were, there was a conversation that went on about how, um, uh, what is it? S Stranger. There's a game that's being dropped and, and streamers aren't allowed to play the end, uh, publicly. They can't stream the end of the game. It's in final, final fantasy 14. Um, you can't play the end of the game publicly. You, you can't stream it. Um, and um, I, I just thought it was really absurd because I will not play Elden Ring. Uh, it's not my style of game. It's awesome to watch. There's a lot of first person games that I wouldn't watch or that I wouldn't buy. I wouldn't play um, just because it's not my style, but I can still appreciate the gamer and the game and the community. Um, but in this particular instance, man, they allowed everybody to do whatever the heck they wanted. And it was awesome. Everybody that I've watched play Elden Ring. Um, it's been an amazing game. The graphics are amazing. Um, the world building is fantastic. I hope that it makes it an MMO and that I don't have to use a controller because I'm not a console player. I'm a keyboard and mouse kind of player. Um, but uh, everything about this game is really cool. Um, okay. And so the last article is, um, it's in Constructagon and it says the, the top five best clear 3d printing filaments. Um, I had somebody send me a request, um, not really a direct request. They basically said, I want this. And, um, so I started looking at, um, some filament, um, I've got a bunch of different colors and I was kind of considering printing this for somebody. And so I ran across this and this is an older article. Uh, but since I was looking into it, I figured that other people might be interested in it. Um, m the news that I grab is typically only the 24 hours in the, in the last 24 hours. Uh, but this was from way back in January and if you didn't know about it, there's a ton of different filaments and you can actually print 3D objects with um, a, a 3D printer um, using PETG or PMMA. This is the stuff that DICE is made out of. Um, I might have spoken about this in a previous stream. Um, PLA is um, probably the, the most abundant um, filament. Um, and you can print pretty much everything out of it. Um, it won't have the same resilience. Um, 
and um, it it actually it, they even say it here it smell it doesn't smell unpleasant it actually smells pretty neat and pretty nice um, if you're into that particular smell um, but it's a really sweet smelling thing and it it's not bad the only problem is that um, it discolors over time and uh, it it's a little bit more susceptible to moisture and to heat uh, than some others. And then there's like nylon and TPU. And um, TPU is really interesting because you can print. I am, man, I really have. I've spoken about this before, but you can print wheels um, and other things with TPU. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And if you've never looked into 3D printing, look into 3D printing. There's a lot of different technologies out there now, a lot of different types of 3D printers, and um, it's getting a lot simpler and more cost uh, approachable. I'll put it to you that way. It's much more approachable than it was when I first started 3D printing. Um, you can get a really nice high-end uh, quality for maybe $150. And uh, you have to fine tune it and stuff like that and get the right filament. Um, but it's pretty neat. Okay. And so with that, that's the end of this show. I want to thank you for watching it here on Twitch. If you're in my chat, um, nobody's been chatting for a while. Uh, if you are here and you haven't followed me, please follow me. That counter right there um, needs to hit 100. Um, or not 100. It needs to hit 50. Not 50%, but we're at about 50% right now, but I need 50 followers. Um, please tell a friend, come and chat. Um, I'm going to be posting this eventually over to YouTube and the podcast, Omtown. Um, you can just do a sir or go to omtown.com and join the website. There's a Discord. I'm pretty much, you know, set tech wise and, and feature wise. Um, I just need people to come and hang out. Um, and I think that's it for the day. I will see you tomorrow, 6 p.m., same place. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks for coming. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.